So Grace, I'll ask you these questions. How many times have you missed messages uh, when you have accounts in other tenants that you have to switch on Teams because you didn't see the notification and by the time you get that email, it's too late? Yeah, countless. Like, I yes. could not tell you. And the amount of time I've probably wasted trying to figure out where it is and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yes, endless. Yes. So this was announced as a public preview this last month, and we're starting rolling out these new features for multi-tenant organizations uh, on the new Microsoft Teams desktop app for Windows. So this will enable, uh, you know, admins have when this will enable the capabilities for administrators to configure those settings for multi-tenant organizations in the Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Hello again, and welcome to another episode of our 425 show in our monthly series of what's new in Microsoft Entra ID. If you're new here, then welcome. Um, and if you're a return viewer, then thanks for coming back. It's nice to see you. Glad to see we didn't scare you off last month. So today we've got some really exciting announcements for you for September. Not sure where the first nine months of the year has gone, but here we are. So for GA, we're going to run you through today uh, conditional access for protected actions, cross-tenant access settings for custom roles and protected actions, as well as for B2B collaboration improvements. Then we'll move through talking to you about a fantastic GA announcement for Auth Plane for tenant restrictions V2, as well as enhancements to all users and user profiles, as well as user and invite users. Then we'll run you through our three public preview announcements this month, which is identity secure score in Microsoft Entra recommendations, time-based rules for dynamic groups and dynamic admin units, and we'll round off with multi-tenant collaboration for Microsoft Teams. So as you can tell, it's been a busy month for updates um, as we start off the new here, year here at Microsoft. So before we kick off, um, I'm just going to remind you of what um, our different preview programs are. So we have a private preview, and that's during this phase, we invite a few customers to talk, uh, to take part in early access to new concepts and features, and that phase doesn't include formal support. We then have public preview, which we're going to run run you through today and during that phase we allow any customer with the proper licensing to evaluate the feature and our support services will uh, supply support services during this phase but not with the normal SLA and then we uh, go generally available yay after the public preview is completed and that means that the feature is open for any licensed customer to use and is supported via all of our support channels and our wonderful techies behind the scenes. So before we kick off, I want to tell you a funny story that I read in the news today. So I don't know if anybody, uh, if you've just woken up, you probably missed it. If you're based in the UK, it's been all over the media. So there's this koala, right, called Claude, that's been causing carnage in Australia. So there's this uh, like plant store, we call it a nursery over here, and they were growing these seedlings. Um, and for the life of them, they couldn't figure out who or what was eating these seedlings. Um, and so much like security, network security, perimeter security, um, they had fences and they were establishing their controls and trying to investigate what was going on. They thought it was actually a possum. So they even set a possum trap. But then it actually turns out it was this koala who's been called Claude, right? who had found his way into the saplings and was eating the eucalyptus trees. Now, why am I telling you this? Apart from the hilarious story that ironically, the koala was eating the seedlings that they were growing to try and replace the eucalyptus trees for koalas. But it's an important reminder that when we talk about identity and security, you have to always be aware of new threats. Never assume that it's a possum. It could be a very greedy koala. And you always need to be monitoring uh, your landscape to see what's going on. So don't be uh, a, what's it, a possum. Watch out for your koalas. So with that in mind and with you all suitably confused, uh, we're going to try a new style today. So Jorge is going to run you through the content. I'm going to sit back and, um, you know, ask various questions. And we're also going to try out some live demos. So with the usual caveats that come with working with live demos, we're hoping it works, but please bear with us. <laughs> if there's any major problems, we'll, we'll blame the demo deities wherever they are. So without further ado, let's kick off and I'll hand over to you, Jorge, to get things going. 
Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, uh, and that is an amazing story. So I love Claude already, the koala. So that's uh, definitely teaches a good story. Uh, all right. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jorge Lopez. I'm a product manager at Microsoft in the identity space. Uh, same team as Grace. Uh, you know, we were here last month. So we're going to continue doing this every month for you to know what's new in some of the Entra IT capabilities. And just as last month, just a quick reminder as well that we have things that went GA and we're going to talk about some of the stuff that went public preview too. And without further ado, I want to show you and talk to you about the first one, right? Which is a, something that I myself consider very important, something that some of my customers wear you know, uh, looking for to kind of like protect those sensitive operations by defining granular policies that you can specify in conditions in conditional access policy. And we do this through authentication context, right? So, uh, for example, um, you can have organizations that can require administrators to complete phishing resistant multi-factor authentication, right? Which is important right now. Like what is the difference between a normal MFA versus phishing resistant? You get better protection, you get a more secure way to provide that strong authentication factor. So imagine doing that on top of a protected action, right? Not only the type of application you're trying to access, what if somebody wants to change a conditional access policy, for instance, or uh, update the name locations that you have in conditional access? We have now this control that when GA, that it's definitely going to help you with that. So if an administrator already has the role and completed, let's say, PIM or something, um, you can now request to uh, things like, if you're going to make changes to these important configurations, let's make sure that you provide this custom control. So uh, a few examples will be that. Another one that I can tell you is maybe, uh, you know, all, you can only make these type of protected actions through privilege access workstations or do FIDO2 keys uh, for, you know, modifying these type of things. So uh, before I show you how to configure all of this, I wanted to switch to something else because uh, it is related to some of the uh, things that we're going to show. And it's about the cross-tenant and access settings for custom roles and protected actions. So uh, what we do here basically is to add the actions and um, all of the different scopes and permissions that administrators can do to change cross-tenant and access settings and things that can be managed with customer roles in your organization. So you can add those actions and those permissions into the authentication context to be added then to a conditional access policy through protected actions. I know it sounds a little bit complicated, but believe me, it's super easy. I'll show you how to configure this. Uh, but what you do now is that this enables you to define your own finely scope roles to manage these cross-tenant access settings. So for those that are not familiar with cross-tenant access settings, these are just type of setting and trust that you can add into specific organizations where uh, you define what to trust and what type of groups and users can access certain apps on a separate cross-tenant uh, uh, organization, right? Uh, you can define these custom roles to manage that and definitely, you know, uh, start doing all of these different, you know, reduction of capabilities and type of actions that an administrator can take highly requested feature. So now you can basically manage these cross tenant access settings through a more reduced uh, capability of terms of permissions that you can do, right? And what you can and cannot do. So uh, for this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch to my lab or I'm gonna switch to the Microsoft Entra Admin Center so I can show you how we do this. And one of the things that you have to do first is just basically go to um, um, protection and you visit the conditional access policies um, blade. From here, you're gonna have into the manage section an authentication context uh, placeholder, right? And what this does, it works as a placeholder to place all of those permissions that you can use later in the conditional access policy. So I'm gonna show you how to create one. You click on new authentication content. So for this one, Let's call it cross-tenant access settings permissions. You can go as granular as you like. And for the description, I'm just gonna use the same. 
uh, publish two apps is necessary so you can see these in conditional access policies. And the ID is just sort of a placeholder that you can use later uh, on, on a token to kind of like request those, uh, you know, uh, those settings over the token. So uh, we have 25 of them. For now, just see this as a play, placeholder and some of the documentation we explain a little bit more on what this does and, and how can you use it. So we're going to save this for now. And the next thing that we're going to do is uh, then go to, you, we define the authentication context placeholder. So now we're going to go to roles and admins. Within roles and admins, you're going to see these protected actions capabilities. And then from here, we're going to add those protected actions to the authentication context placeholder that we just created, which is across and an access permissions. We're going to select the permissions. And now I'm going to show you that you can see the things that we were talking about, right? So the cross and access policies, permissions, and some of the descriptions on each of these permissions and what you cannot do. So you can either select all of the stuff if you want to find us as, as a role, but in this case, I'm just going to say, you know, for partners, actually, let me use another one. Uh, let's, do, let's do B2B direct connect uh, settings or B2B collaboration, right? We're going to pick those permissions that we want to be and protect for this particular authentication context. But like I said, I'll encourage you to visit like all of the different things that you can do now with this cross tenant stuff. So, um, all right, so we added that to the authentication context that we define. So what we do next is go back to protection and conditional access. And now this is gonna give us the capabilities to pick that authentication context within uh, a conditional access policy. So I'm just gonna call it CA for cross tenant access policies. And then of course you wanna maybe map these to certain users for testing purposes. I'm just gonna show you uh, the main thing that I want you to see, which is on the target resources, you're going to have this option that is called authentication context. Within authentication context, then you can pick those cross tenant access settings permissions that you can define now. And then just basically first do it as a report only so you can see some logs and how it works and maybe turn it on. So, uh, and before I forget, I was actually for. I was actually missing the great part or the best thing of this, that the grant control. So the grant control is going to go with, okay, so I define this target and I define for all of my users that try to do that authentication context. You can then define the required authentication strength, for instance, which is a good example of why would you like to do this and request a phishing resistant MFA for those capabilities. So now any time or every time that now somebody wants to modify those settings, uh, you can request that grant control from here. So uh, on the same, along the same lines, you know, we were talking about cross tenant, um, cross tenant um, access controls and set up custom roles for that granularity. Uh, let's show you those particular things. So now we can create a custom role for cross tenant access settings. It's of course just a test name. And now if you search for those permissions, you're going to find those cross tenant access policy permissions that now you can add to these custom controls to reduce, like I said, the, uh, the reach of each of these roles that they can do, right? And if you just want a specific group of users to only create and delete these type of policies or update them or, or change the type of cloud endpoints or B2B direct connection, this is now a way that you can do that. Okay, so that's for the first couple of things. So one of the things that I also want to mention, like make sure that you bring your questions like on the chat. We have our great producers in the back, Nick. We have Mark, Bailey, Jeff that are helping us with all of the different stuff. So uh, Grace, what do you think about this one? Uh, I think it was a big thing that was being asked lately, right? Yeah, huge. Um, so Antonio made a good comment. It's, it is kind of like tagging, but to the next level. So being able to go down to the specific action level is so important because you can just go above and beyond, you know, alerting on these things. You can now put protective actions 
behind conditional access policies to suit your needs without limiting their, you know, your admin's ability to do things when they need to. Um, and especially as we move forward uh, with fish resistant multi-factor um, and, you know, using things like device based CA as well. I think it's fabulous as a really strong story in terms of protecting the right users and the right actions. Um, and it also it works together so seamlessly. And I love the auth context tags. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a great user experience uh, for both the admins and the people that are consuming it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, great input, Grace. Appreciate all of that. Uh, so let's uh, let's talk about the next thing, right? So another thing that went GA, that's part of the Microsoft Entra ID, is cross and access settings, uh, B2B collaboration improvement. So we still we, we stay on the same um, you know uh, line about the the cross and access policies and the improvements. And for this, you can now use. Uh, an allow list or block list to allow or block invitations to B2B collaboration users from specific organizations, right? So you can be granular to set what type of collaboration you want to do with those specific organizations, right? If you want to block personal email address domains, you can set up a block list like contains like things like Gmail or Outlook.com. Or if you have a business or a partnership on other organizations, let's say Contoso, Fabricam, uh, whatever the other names that we use for our labs. Um, if you want to restrict invitations to only these organizations, you can then add those domains like Contoso or Fibercam and Leadware or whatever the case is to those lists. So, uh, so that's one of the things that we do here. I'm just going to show you real quick. So I'll go, I'm going to go back to uh, the Entra ID Admin Center and basically show you real quick how you do this is just basically go to the users tab or users blade you go to user settings in these user settings all the way at the bottom you're going to find external users a link that has a manage external collaboration settings and then at the bottom you find these collaboration restrictions for cross tenant and access settings where you're going to have the uh, deny invitations to specific domains if you want to do this um, to say, you know, I, I want to block invites or invitations to these specific domains, you add them there on the target domains. Or if you just want to restrict your invitations to specific domains, that is the most restrictive one, then you add the domains here, like Contoso.com and multiple domains, if that's the case. So that's just basically what we do with these external collaboration settings there. So uh, I may see that there may be some questions coming in. So um let's see question what if the role does not exist and create from scratch like previous sub permissions uh i'm not sure about that one grace i don't know if you uh i'm, I'm trying to get a little bit more context on the role that does not exist and create from scratch so i think so actually if uh, so let me check who said, so Ken, maybe if you can elaborate a little bit, it'd be great. I think from what I've understood, he's kind of asking, you know, if you can't create a custom role for something that you want to protect, you know, what, what do you do? So for example, this is for purview, um, and that's the action, you know, within purview, they want to protect some kind of admin action. How, how you know, how would you create that? Um, so Ken, feel free to add a little bit more context and if, if you like, uh, we we have, you know, people to help on answer those questions and they can bring it in as well at any time. So that's the piece around the, um, the allow or deny list. So let's move to the next one, which is another thing that went GA and this is an interesting one. And there's a few things that. We want to make sure that uh, we clarify for everybody. So authentication plane tenant restrictions or TRV2 for authentication plane. So uh, this is something that the name is probably very familiar to you. So uh, tenant restrictions was a feature or is still a feature out there that uh, came out a few years ago, right? That you can set up a proxy and then some, some send some headers into the authentication request on uh, you know, the corporate proxy to the tech that if a user tries to access a, a different type of tenant, you can block it right there. So 
Uh, Tenant Restrictions version 2 is going to have a lot of different features on that, and we can talk about that later. Uh, Grace posted a, an amazing uh, post on the read, one of her Read Only Friday series about Tenant Restrictions versus, versus version 2 uh, that you can read about like all of the things that you can do. For this one, Authentication Plane, I want to separate like this one from Data Plane. Authentication Plane is the only one that right now went to GA. The other one's still in public preview, so just have that in mind. So what you do with this one is increase the security and limit that what users can access when they use external account signing from your network devices, right? So this, the great benefit with TRV2 that you get versus TRV1 is that you can go more granular now because TRV2 is connected to the cross tenant access settings capabilities that you can set up uh, to you know, control what type of uh, users, applications, and tenants can access with them with those external identities, right? So, uh, something important to clarify as well: the authentication plain tenant restrictions will use a header uh, in the authentication as well to look up for those restrictions. So, you still need a proxy for this one, right? And block that at the authentication level, not the data plane protection. The data plane protection will be. Uh, when a user tries to access an external application, they will copy the authentication response token and they obtain outside from Contoso, for instance, and put it into the Windows device. Uh, so Azure AD for the data plane uh, compares those headers and basically if they don't match, they will block it. But like, like I said, again, let's focus on the authentication plane, right? So with this one, the benefits that you get is basically block those logins with external identities on your tenant based on the policy that you set up, right? And you need to deploy the proxy, like I said, put those headers and link it to a policy ID and a tenant ID instead of the previous TRV one that you use, for instance, like uh, I think before there was just a specific uh, header and a value, like uh, uh, live that or something like that, and now you can yeah. do more granular stuff, right? That you can add on the header, the value of the policy ID for, for cross-tenant access settings, uh, the uh, tenant ID, and then the proxy or the authentication piece will look up for that. So Grace, anything you want to add before we show or yeah. the audience how this works? Yeah, so initially, so tenant restrictions B1 actually went out in 2017, which is, you know, six years ago. And so much has changed in that time in terms of how we think about identity, uh, threat landscape. Um, you know, people are truly now with everything that happened in COVID having to work on any device at any time, on any platform, on any connection. And so naturally tenant restrictions needed to improve to kind of help with that. And so if you also used to using TRV1, the admin was, it had a very high overhead um, for not great granularity, some of the feedback that we heard. Uh, and so we took that on board. And so with integrating the auth plane tenant restrictions with um, cross tenant access settings, you've got that one Azure portal page where you can go and uh, scope to apps, to groups, down to users, um, and really get granular so that you don't have to just do a complete allow or block on those um, URLs that you used to have to put in in the proxy. And so there is a, a really good question here, from Antonio, which is organizations with tenant restrictions in place will be automatically upgraded to TRV2 question mark. So um, at the moment, there is no we are not going to force. Uh, TRV1 consumers to move to TRV2. It has to be something that the tenant and the network team within their organization establish to move to. Um, in terms of migration path, that's completely up to the organization to arrange with you know, suitable change management and the relevant teams for both end user devices, networking and identity. I would say the big call out that is in our a deployment docs where it tells you how to configure TRV2 and then what you would need to do to remove TRV1 is actually it's important to note one of the big things with Authplane is that you can control MSA accounts and so the issue is if in TRV1 you had its login.live.com you would need to stop sending that 
if you were going to operate TRV1 and TRV2 at the same time, because that can cause a conflict because um, it just it won't interact well, especially if you're setting up MSA. And the great thing about this is because with MSAs, it's not all bad. Yes, it could be all bad, uh, relatively bad in the scheme of enterprise security and data exfiltration is, yes, you may want to stop somebody accessing hotmail.com, but you may want them to still authenticate to something like uh, Microsoft Learn or Microsoft Enterprise Skills Initiative. And so you can control that at the app ID level now. So again, you're providing more flexibility and better end user experience without compromising on security. And it's just a much better admin experience in terms of controlling and monitoring those um, cross tenant access policies. Because I've had customers that have jumped on TRV1 very early and loved it. And then now, six years later, they've got this huge list of URLs that they were uh, blocking and it's they don't know basically which was correct because over time it's just been updated there's multiple of the same things things that don't even make sense so I definitely think if you are looking into this evaluate what you've currently got in place with TRV1 or elsewhere um, have a look at how you might configure TRV2 to meet your needs uh, and then you can test it uh, with a proof of concept with a smaller group of users because you can target it and then you can plan your migration as well. Amazing. So yeah, as you can tell, huge fan of TRV2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think I think uh, to the point that you were making is that definitely uh, right now there's no plans for upgrading automatically, but it is important. I think you you made a great point, which is if you want to plan to use them like side by side, there's certain things that you need to be aware uh, to modify from the proxy headers that you're sending today into you know uh, TRV2, so it doesn't conflict with that. It's a great story. I, I remember having conversations about like I have this huge list on my proxy. I don't even know where it came from, and I don't know who gave this to us. So now what? What do we do? How do we know, right? And uh, so so yeah. So now having that granularity that you can go to cross tenant access settings definitely gives you that great advantage versus TRV1. But yeah, and uh, it's all audited yeah. as well. That's what I forgot to say. So like in terms of change management. Back then, it was just somebody like updating a file or whatever that was probably in somebody's inbox potentially. Now, all those actions are audited. You have to have the right admin permissions to do it. Yeah. Um, and it's all centrally managed. So, yeah, it's a great story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, let's just switch into uh, the Enter Admin Center. So, I can just show you real quick where are you going to find these tenant restrictions. Uh, just a caveat that I'm going to use here is you're going to see some stuff that is still in preview, like I mentioned, which is the data plane. But uh, I just want to definitely show you how to configure this, which is uh, you will go to uh, on the admin center, you will find the external identities blade and cross tenant access settings, right? And from here, you're going to notice that some of the stuff that you may have already set up as cross tenant access settings, some of the things new that you're going to see is in the default settings at the bottom, you're going to start start seeing these tenant restrictions. And then you can um, edit those tenant restrictions, uh, you know, default settings right from here. This is going to be important uh, if you start uh, doing this because you're going to need the tenant ID and the policy ID to configure all of the rest of the settings, right? So that's why we put it at the top of uh, the settings. So let's say that you want to go granular with specific uh, tenant, you you're going to find this last column uh, to the right, where you're going to then click on it and then customize those def default settings to block access or select access to, or to certain you know, users or groups uh, because this is an external uh, tenant. You need to get the IDs from that. Or if you want to start allowing or blocking access to those external applications, then you can add those Microsoft applications and different things. So that's really uh, the way that you configure this. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention is just have in mind that granularity that you know Grace and I were mentioning versus TRV1. On that link that uh, has been posted a few times in TRV2, you will find a table that compares the things that you can do with TRV1 versus TRV2. So uh, take a look at it. Uh, it it's, it's very good if you want to if you are using TRV1 and want to start seeing into the capabilities for TRV2. <laughs> I just want to shout out as well. I think we're probably going to do a, a technical deep dive on TRV2 in one of the future shows. So 
there's any particular questions like I love that one about migration we'll definitely touch on that um, if there's anything you really want to know about TLB2 please drop us a comment let us know we'll make sure we cover it off and we'll publish when we get that booked in as well amazing all right so let's talk about some of the enhancements that we have been working on on the around the UX piece right so uh, the old users and the user profile so with this we are doing, uh, you know, basically things that will show you, uh, you know, certain blades or certain, uh, I, I forgot the name, I need to look this up, so the feed cards, yes, uh, feed cards about the users that are now based out and responsive to roles, so RBAC roles. So the user profile that you look up now today for certain users will show you, you know, the, uh, certain permissions or properties depending on the permissions that uh, that particular administrator has. So we are kind of like trying to uh, expand this uh, to all of the user properties that are exposed in Microsoft Graph, including extension attributes as well, to kind of like match what you can do with a call to Microsoft Graph and the things that you can find in the uh, Microsoft Enter ID Admin Center on the user's profile and the all user's blade. So that's one of the things. The other enhancement that we did to the users is the creation and in invitation of a user, right? So uh, because, you know, now we have the ability to do a specific things when you create a user to auto-generate a password, for instance, right? And let's talk about internal users first. Uh, or set a custom password for the user. Now you can add... It, at creation of the user, uh, add that user to an administrative unit or a role. Uh, the old UX has allowed you to do a role. Now you can do administrative users, or you can add these users to a group on creation as well. So we try to mimic the same um, wizard-like or experience that we have for you when you create any other Azure resource. And that's one of the main capabilities that we improve over here. So EWNGA, uh, you have probably seen it by now, and it's one of the main things that we want to do. So I'm going to show you real quick how these improvements look like. This is the last piece that we're going to talk about going GA, and then we'll go to the public preview piece. So for this, basically, I'm just going to show you what we've been talking about, which is the all users blade. Uh, and then let's say that we pick one specific users. Now we have these capabilities, like, of course, there's a lot of different things that were improved, like the MFA status, if it's capable or not, if he has so, some sort of B2B collaboration, some of the uh, signings that you can jump directly from here, and the properties one. So the properties is going to show you way more capabilities or way more properties for that user that now you can check directly here instead of having to do a graph call, which is usually the way that we used to do it before, or I used to do it before. And let me show you uh, some of the other improvements, right? So let's say that I want to create a user here. Um, and like I said, you probably have seen this, but create a new user now gives you this wizard-like experience where you can select the domain, set up a, a user principal name for this, auto-generate a password that you can copy, uh, of course, I'm not going to jump into the things about generating a tap temporary access password instead, but let's say that you're creating this from scratch. It gives you that uh, ability to do it. Uh, modify certain properties uh, of the user at creation, add some administrative units, add user to the group or add it to a role, and then just the last piece, which is just review and create, of course, right? So those are the user enhancements that we did. Uh, and hopefully, you know, that has been helpful for you. So let's jump into the public preview stuff that we have been working on because uh, this is something that, you know, we have been busy on it. So uh, I'm going to switch to my slide here real quick. Out. So about the updates for yeah. like the user experience and the, the UI there in the portal. Like, I think this is really important to point out that because all organizations are different, not just in size and nature of business, but of course, between the levels of support that you have in your organization, some people have one person that's their whole IT team. Some people have multiple levels of support from help desk all the way down to their deep principal engineers. And so some customers really want everything to be, you know, config as code. They want it all to be in the graph. And yet some also have the requirement where they need to be able to get access to, say, those user um, attributes that we pointed out, which weren't previously in that card view. They were only accessible through graph. You can see that now. So depending on the level of uh, 
potentially level of depth of skills, knowledge, or their role. You know, now your um, admins or whoever needs to get access can do this all in the portal without having to potentially learn or use Microsoft Graph. Um, so that's an important thing because I know some people are like, oh, why would you not just do it with Graph? Well, some, sometimes there isn't the need or this necessarily don't need to do something at that scale. If you need to go and make two clicks on a user profile, uh, you know, that's a lot quicker than necessarily doing it through Graph if you've then got to learn Graph, for example. So, you know, I, I think it's a nice nice touch which caters for all of our customers with various different levels of, of admins and their needs. A quick tip if you're learning Microsoft Graph, uh, you can go to Graph Explorer and you will find a lot of samples on the left. <laughs> that's how I started I using it. it, it, I it yes. <laughs> Uh, you'll learn graph by looking at the samples that we add there and then just play with the filters and all that stuff. But absolutely, uh, great call out, Grace. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, Postman, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I know who that Postman. is. <laughs> Save all of those calls in Postman, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome. So let's switch into some of the things that we have on public preview today. So uh, one of them is Identity Secure Score in Microsoft Venture Recommendations. So, two features that having out there that you can now combine into one or we're combining into one. So identity secure score that gives you basically a score based on certain recommendations or uh, security recommendations in your Azure AD tenant or Microsoft Entry AD tenant uh, and Microsoft Entry recommendations, which is usually focused on things like um, application recommendations, secrets that are about to expire, or certain uh, recommendations that are also related to your Entra ID applications. Uh, are going to be integrated together. So this will be a consolidated view of all of the base, best practices that we're encouraging customers to follow on a single place. Um, my identity score is not that good. It's a lab, so don't <laughs> pay attention to that 63%. Hopefully all of you have a better score than that one. So uh, the next one is about... Uh, I noticed oh, a question. Got, so, yeah. Yeah, right. we've got a question. So, um, did Secure Score counting of MFA enforcement get fixed? Good question. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I actually don't know off the top of my head. Um, yeah. yeah, let's take that away and get back to you because I do remember that. Um, <laughs> I would also point out, like with Secure Score, if you're not using it yet or you haven't had a look, like go and have a look at it execs and senior leaders love it it's gamification ultimately of your security story and so you get this great view of actions that you've done that have increased your score like they just love it like they, they just love it they eat it up i've got a customer who reports on it basically to their senior leadership on a monthly basis to show where they've improved or potentially where we've updated secure score recommendations so they need to go and ask for projects, for example, or uh, for people to be assigned from other teams or their teams to implement that. And it's really beautiful to like see that go end to end working for, you know, the IAM engineers that want buy in and the execs that want to see the value of having Entra, uh, Microsoft Entra ID. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great one. And yes, I did think it was you, Daniel Stefaniak. So hiya. Thanks for yes. coming. Hey, Daniel. <laughs> We recognize you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining, by the way. Uh, so it looks like Mark, Mark already gave me a D minus for uh, that specific answer. So uh, I don't know, Grace, maybe I will come back this mo next month. We'll see that. Uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, awesome. Amazing. Thank you for the input, Daniel. We appreciate you joining. Um, so let's talk about the next one. So time-based rules for dynamic groups and dynamic administrative units. This one, if you have been using dynamic groups before, you know that you can create groups based on certain properties and certain attributes. For the um, for all of this time, mostly those attributes and those properties are related to things like the department or other things uh, you know that are related to more the where the user belongs. This news one, this new one is about employee hire date uh, that allows you to create this group that will group employees together based on the start date, right? This employee hire date is some of the attributes that we added lately as part of the lifecycle workflows, the capabilities that we released uh, uh, lately. So one tip, we're gonna have a level 400 on lifecycle workflows soon as part of the show. So uh, be in the lookout week. for that. 
Yes. I think it's next week. And that's going to be a real technical deep dive. So yes. definitely schedule and tune into that one. It's going to be awesome. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I'll we'll 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 give you that information, of course, but it's next week, so don't miss it. Uh, so one of the things that we just to uh, complement this, uh, basically create that group that allows you to do like, if you want to get all the people that are going to start, let's say next week, you can create that dynamic group that allows those other expression and properties to define, you know, uh, employee hire date uh, less or equal than maybe seven days or stuff like that. So use it. And then this last one, which is probably some something that. It's not directly related to Entra ID, but we wanted to share it because we work together with you know the team's uh, team as well on the multi-tenant collaboration for Microsoft Team. So Grace, I'll ask you these questions. How many times have you missed messages uh, when you have accounts in other tenants that you have to switch on Teams because you didn't see the notification and by the time you get that email, it's too late? Yeah, countless. Like I yes. could not tell you. And the amount of time I've probably wasted trying to figure out where it is and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yes. Endless. Yes. So this was announced as a public preview this last month. And we're starting rolling out these new features for multi-tenant organizations uh, on the new Microsoft Teams desktop app for Windows. So this will enable, uh, you know, admins have... when. This will enable the capabilities for administrators to configure those settings for multi-tenant organizations in the Microsoft 365 Admin Center. And then with that, with the new Teams desktop client, uh, let's say that an organization goes through merges and acquisitions, uh, or you need to support partners or subsidiaries or whatever the case is, right? Uh, this complexity will always cause those users to kind of like try and keep switching between you know tenants when they have uh, B2B accounts or guest accounts in multiple tenants. That happened to me. That happened to probably all of you. These new MTO capabilities will be a seamless experience with collaborating with coworkers on these multi-tenant organizations because now you will have, you know, access to all of these experiences like search, chat, calling meetings, content sharing without eliminating the silos and bringing users together so across the tenant binder boundary. So side-by-side -side multitasking and cross-tenant notifications that you can get when you get a message from that other tenant, uh, people search and chat experiences, uh, share channels for seamless cross-tenant collaboration, and all, all of the different things that we're improving as part of these uh, teams. So, um, okay, so that's that uh i i think there's a question we do have here. a question yeah, yeah from ken so the question is is mto and cross tenant sync complementary are these considerations when, when to, to use, use both, both or one? yes absolutely so uh I would say complementary and and not right. So and and maybe you know you can you can uh, expand on that grace as well. But you know the cross tenant sync is just a capability that if you trust, let's say that you go through a merger or an acquisition, uh, if you trust that other organization, you can then automatically uh, do all of these invitations, avoiding the accepting invitation all of this stuff uh, to make those uh, access through uh, you know other tenants and collaboration through other tenants seamless through the administrator because you can just add users to the scope and synchronize those accounts over there as guests. So that will be the benefit of cross-tenant sync, right? The MTO collaboration is kind of like a separate where you can then set up those type of rules like, you know, to make sure that you collaborate uh, nicely like on the Teams, uh, new Teams client through those users, right? So they are not uh, dependent on each other, but, uh, but there's definitely something that are complementary that you can use together for a seamless experience for your guest users that are collaborating across different tenants. So, uh, Grace, yeah. anything you want to add there? Yeah, I think Arts is definitely complementary. Um, and as you said, they kind of got two different use cases uh, where you would be using uh, potentially both of them for your uh, own tenants that you know which you own and you have a high level of trust compared to those which you want to collaborate with, but you don't have, want to do a full sync um, of. And so a great example of that is um, the people search improvements. So you can now go in and, and search and have a much better experience at finding your, um, you know, your, your guests, getting to the right guest account. Um, that 
caused some missed message pain over the years. Um, and so that's kind of where you would see, OK, yes, I want to be able to search for guests as well as be able to contact external users in an easy way um, where they may not be invited in as a guest at all or be part of that multi-tenant sync functionality because they're not in a tenant that's under your same like corporate legal entity as such. Amazing. That is a, an amazing feature, I'll, I'll tell you that. Like, uh, I don't think I have had any uh, any customer or any person that will say, no, I don't like it. Uh, it's definitely something uh, well expected. So uh, perfect. Uh, so let's jump back. I think that's the last public preview uh, that we have. We're just going to go through some of the closing stuff. So I'll start with, you know, first of all, follow us on LinkedIn because we're creating all of these different spaces for you to have this connection with us, uh, discuss all of the things that are coming out, uh, the what's new on Entra ID, some of the level 400 shows. Next week, be in the lookout. We're going to have a Lifecycle Workflows a level 400 show that I'm sure that you're going to like it. We're going to deep dive into what it is, what we're working on, what are the stuff that, you know, helps organizations on board, pre on board, off board users do changes on the fly and all that stuff. So uh, this is, this is definitely something that you don't want to miss. If you miss one of our shows, including this one, you can watch it on our YouTube channel. AKA MS 425 show forward slash YouTube is going to take you to, to our channel. Uh, we publish all of our past shows there. So if you missed any, make sure that you visit that link. Uh, you're going to find, find us there. And lastly, uh, thank you so much for joining. Hopefully this, this was very helpful. You know, we didn't have as many announcements as last month. We're going to have more next month. Uh, so please follow us. Be in the look at all of, all of this. So hopefully you start looking into some of the details and some of the features that we show you today. If you have any questions, you can still use this same post on LinkedIn, post your questions over there. We'll have multiple people that can help on answering those questions. So uh, from my side, I appreciate you joining. Grace, uh, do you have any other comments or do we have any more questions on the chat? So we do actually have a question before we close uh, from Atlanta, which is exciting. Um, so they've asked, what license do you need to leverage the Entra functionality in general? So, I mean, that's a very open question. So the easiest thing for me to say is our license, our licenses have a bunch of different SKUs, um, as well as uh, to fit your different needs, you know, whether it's first time worker, enterprise, kiosk worker, that sort of thing. Uh, and so you can uh, do a mix and match. Um, so if you have a look, we'll get one of the team to pop the link in the channel. You can go and have a look at all the licenses. And it does even break down what features are in specific SKUs. So previously, you may have come across the concept of P1 and P2. We now have additional SKUs so that if customers want to leverage some of our other great new um, emerging technologies and uh, some of our really amazing stuff that we uh, announced at our um, secure access event a couple of months ago that's all broken down there as well so you can figure out based on what your needs and what you're looking for what you'll need to uh request as a trial or speak to your uh volume licensing team or seller about so we'll get that link put in the chat to you so uh, to wrap i just want to say thank you very much for locking in again and spending this time with us we really appreciate it it means a lot it's nice to see some returners some new faces some uh old colleagues as well so just as a recap, what we went through today were our GA announcements for September, including conditional access for protected actions and for custom roles and protected actions. We also have cross-tenant access settings for B2B collaboration improvements, authentication playing, tenant restrictions, TRV2, one of my, I'm not meant to have favorites, I suppose, with features, it's a bit like, you know, children or shoes but that is definitely one of my favorite announcements this month uh, and enhancements to all users and user profile as well as user and invite user experiences then we ran through public preview which included identity secure score in microsoft entra recommendations go and check a look check that have a look see what your recommendations are also if you're not consuming the identity secure score um, and shouting about your successes or where you need support share it with your slt as i said they love it 
gamification uh, and makes it really easy to consume and understand. We also ran through time-based rules for dynamic groups and dynamic admin units, multi-tenant collaboration for Microsoft Teams at the end stole the show. So all the links and additional info and further reading will be included in the post. Uh, we will be sharing this recording over all of our various socials and channels. So please, if you weren't able to join all of it um, or if you're coming in late, don't panic. It'll all be across YouTube and the internet forever and ever and ever. Uh, and also, we would love to hear from you. So we make this, um, you know, as soon as we get the announcements through, we're playing with the format. We're great to hear that your feedback, that you guys love the demos. Please let feedback keep coming. Let me know. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And hopefully, we'll see you next month for more updates from Microsoft Entra. We'll be here. Yeah. And thank you, everyone who uh, works behind the scenes to get this, uh, make this possible for the 425 show. Yeah, so thank you, Nick, absolutely. our producer for today. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Mark, Jeff, Bailey.